and welcome to this continuing webinar series being offered throughout the month of February entitled Living a Wild Life, Catch Me If You Can, a production of the Center for Biosecurity Studies here at the University of the West Indies Cahill campus in Barbados. My name is Christiane Wolcott. I'm the operations manager here at the center and I'm pleased to once again be opening today's proceedings. These virtual events are never possible without those of you who've been tuning in and therefore I take this opportunity to especially acknowledge our colleagues and students from around the KFL campus as well as the wider UWI community. Uh, any members of the advisory committee of the Center for Biosecurity Studies joining us today, all collaborators and stakeholders of this Caribbean Wildlife Initiative, you our viewers, members of the media, and of course today's featured panelists, Dr. Michelle Singh, animal scientists with the Caribbean Agricultural Research and Development Institute, CARDI, Dr. Natalie Van Vlie, wildlife and livelihoods expert with the Center for International Forestry Research, C4, Dr. Rod Supal, veterinary pathologist at the School of Veterinary Medicine, the UWI St. Augustine campus, and Dr. Tarya Sironin, associate professor of emerging infectious diseases at the University of Helsinki. To those of you who are returning viewers to this series, we warmly welcome you back for today's edition. And for those of you who are joining us today for the first time, we welcome you as well. We want to assure you that you're not disadvantaged in any way if this is your first presentation that you're attending. Uh, this particular forum was launched on February 4th as the Center for Biosecurity Studies embarked on this sensitization campaign to inform and educate the public about this recently conceived collaborative study known as the Caribbean Wildlife Initiative. This limited series, Living a Wild Life, Catch Me If You Can, is a four-part series, today being the third installment, with the final presentation to come next Thursday, February 25th at 1 p.m. That's Eastern Caribbean time, or otherwise known as Atlantic time. So we do encourage you not to miss that forum, where everything will be neatly tied up for you, and you'll hear more about where we go from here with this initiative. For those of you who've missed the previous editions in this series, you'll be able to review those sessions by visiting our website, where we've made the video links available and will continue to do so throughout the rest of the series. And that URL is www.cavehill.uwi.edu forward slash biosecurity. So once again, that's www.cavehill.uwi.edu forward slash biosecurity, and you can check out our previous editions of this series. So we launched the Caribbean Wildlife Initiative two weeks ago with a presentation entitled Biosecurity Implications of Caribbean Wildlife on Health, Border Security, Tourism, Trade and Economy. Last week's panelists presented under the theme Global and Regional Views of Illegal Wildlife Trade and Wildlife Crime. And this week, we continue developing this discussion with today's panelists addressing One Health, wildlife hunting and consumption in the Caribbean. Our panelists are all stakeholders in the Caribbean Wildlife Initiative. So this series has been a fantastic opportunity to hear directly from the researchers, policymakers, and practitioners who are uniquely vested in the outcomes of, of this project. At this time, I now invite Dr. Kurt Douglas, Director of the Center for Biosecurity Studies to introduce our panel of presenters and to moderate the rest of this afternoon's program. And once again, we thank you for joining us today, for supporting the speakers and for being open to hearing more about this highly specialized area of endeavor. Dr. Douglas, it's now over to you. Thank you very much, Christiane, for that warm welcome. And welcome to all of the persons who have been invited and those who are attending this particular event. Now, as the world squints underneath the blinding glare of the current COVID-19 pandemic, with its crippling and frustrating impacts that have been felt globally, preparations are being made for the celebration of World Wildlife Day on the 3rd of March, 2021. But still, several questions remain unanswered. One of the most pressing and perhaps critical one that will be in the minds of many is, how can we stop this from ever happening again? A simple yet heavily involved question. A review of the last 50 years would reveal that COVID-19 is but one of the many infectious disease outbreaks that threaten global populations. Included in this period are 
even influenza or bird flu, Zika, chikungunya, Ebola, Marburg, SARS or the severe acute respiratory syndrome virus, and MERS, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. All, these are all manifestations of a more central problem. And that problem being the relationship between humans and wildlife. What is it about this relationship that invites the risk of episodic but devastating outbreaks? In our quest to improve human civilization and advance our societies, we have left ourselves open to vulnerabilities that are often hidden right in the open. It is therefore important to note that while life as a part of nature has existed in a relatively safe state for centuries, and in many cases in isolation prior to human contact, the activities we as humans are involved in are the drivers that put us at risk, bringing us into closer and more frequent and prolonged contact with wildlife. These can include the clearing of forests, or vegetative areas for agriculture or urban development, wildlife hunting, illegal wildlife trade, even the wild meat or bush meat trade, mining, oil exploration, and several other activities. With the team of this year's World Wildlife Day 2021 celebration, being forests and livelihoods, sustaining people and planet, we in the Caribbean, after looking at the latest um, Living Planet 2020 report released by the Worldwide Fund, or the WWF. It identified the Caribbean along with the Latin America region as being the region with the highest decline in wildlife population, with an estimated 94% being observed from 1970 to 2017. This is a staggeringly high number and overshadows even the problematic region of Southeast Asia, which is three times less. We clearly need to urgently address this problem here in the Caribbean as it relates to our, well, our relationship with wildlife. And here at the Center for Biosecurity Studies, we have launched our Caribbean Wildlife Initiative to examine this critical relationship between humans and Caribbean wildlife. And this has been done with the valued support of many key collaborators and key contributions from the Center for International Forestry Research, or C4, the Caribbean Community Implementation Agency for Crime and Security, CARICOM Impacts, United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, UNODC, the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, and also the Caribbean Agriculture Research and Development Institute, or CARDU. And these are only but a few of the persons and also um, organizations currently involved in this initiative. And with this in mind, I want to pave the way for the introduction of our speakers as we address the issues of wildlife hunting, wild meat consumption within the Caribbean context and how we can position this region as we move forward in 2021. So I introduce to you now our first speaker, Dr. Michelle Singh. Now, Dr. Michelle Singh is an animal scientist at the Caribbean Agriculture Research and Development Institute, or CARDI, who has led with some critical research in the Caribbean on neotropical wildlife species and the potential to develop food sovereignty in the region, utilizing our biodiversity for nutritional needs in several countries in the Caribbean. She has been a particularly strong ally in advancing the CBS Caribbean Wildlife Initiative in its very formative stages and continues to lend very viable support to tackling the burdensome issues of illegal wildlife trade, wildlife crime, and protecting our bioeconomy against biopiracy. She's also a former graduate student of the UWI St. Augustine campus, where she conducted research on neotropical wildlife species and their biological characteristics. And I know that her presentation will be very informative and also very entertaining. So I pass it over to you, uh, Dr. Singh. Hi, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Kirk, for that introduction. I wanna start by um, 
sharing with you some quotations that I've gathered over the years. So some of these would be, we need to use regional materials. We need to match available animals with available resources. And this last one is my particular favorite. More knowledge is generated on imported species than the species that exist in our backyards. And I say that to say that we are endowed with tremendous assets here in the neotropics. And we use the word neotropics to refer to that region that is found just from Southern Mexico to Northern Argentina. We particularly endowed because we have 25% of all known mammals, 33% of all birds of the world, 19% of world reptiles, and about 46% of the world amphibians resident in the neotropics. To marry that information, we also look at the increasing challenge that we have in the Caribbean to feed ourselves and the challenges that face us in terms of food security through climatic changes, the decrease in grains, the increase in feed costs. We already import more than 6 billion US dollars into the region on meat and meat products. And that's a 2020 statistics. However, we have yet to examine the role that indigenous species, which are very, very well adapted to our environmental conditions can play in impacting that regional food import bill. I just wanted to use these photos to highlight to you the diversity of food species which exists in our region. Many of you would be familiar with the Black River Kong, the Cascadura, uh, scientific name Hoplosternum littorale, Spectacle Cayman, the Tigu or Mat. Of course, my particular favorites, the Aguti, Red Brocket Deer, the Collet Peccary, or the Wild Hog as it's called in Trinidad, the Lap or the Laba, Iguanas, Porcupine, Nine-Banded nine Armadillo, the Opossum or the Manicou. Another one of my favorites, the Capybara, or Red-Tailed Boars and Guinea Pigs. And when we speak about neotropical animal utilization, we utilize animals in a variety of ways. And I categorize them in, into education, research, recreation, and conservation. I want us to visit the opportunities that these animals avail to us for the agro-tourism opportunity. And we will use the iguana farming in Belize as an example. And the ecotourism experience is more of an experiential tourism. And we have the opportunity to develop these neotropical animal species into tourist attractions. Here we see the experiences of diverse ages at the alligator farms in, in the Everglades and snake farming in Asia, butterfly farming in St. Martin. Of course, we cannot speak about utilization without addressing the cuisine opportunity. In 2008, a publication indicated that wild meat has higher protein and less fat than the most consumed meat being chicken. And if we were to look at the fat composition, chicken has 30% fat. Every other animal that comes from our forest has, contains way less fat, meaning that it's a more nutritional meat to consume. Some of the work we've done at the Faculty of Food and Agriculture at the UWI is to compare the carcasses of wildlife and rabbit with that of chicken, because a lot of us shop at, at grocery stores, at food stores, where we buy meat parts, right? Chicken parts, leg and thigh, wings, back and neck, breast. And we cut each of these wildlife species similar to how a chicken is fabricated. And that was just to enhance and show that we have the opportunity to develop our own wildlife species, similar to the way the chicken has been developed and been sold to us and is now the most consumed meat. The collared peccary, we've developed hams from that animal, particularly because we wanted to show people that we can use our native species or indigenous wildlife as food species and and integrate it into a high level cuisine. In Peru, the national dish is, is the guinea pig. And a guinea pig is equivalent to a quarter of a chicken. 
So when we talk about production and production types, we look at micro livestock as providing us with an opportunity to replace imported protein and even those domesticated species that we rear, we have to import the feed to feed those animals. So these micro livestock or native species have the opportunity to replace some of those imported feeds and animals. The spectacles came on. This, this, this picture was taken in, in Bolivia in a very, very high, is a five-star restaurant and alligator nuggets was on the menu. And this is in Argentina where rear meat, which was the alternative red meat when mad cow disease um, came about, is being served at their restaurants. These are all coming from farmed meat. Another form of utilization, we're talking value added products, feathers, leather, ethnic products, jewelry, oils, and ethno medicine. Collard peccary skin currently is one of the most, produces one of the most valuable leathers on the world's market. In fact, it is one of the softest leathers and only, can only be used in high end products like gloves and small wallets and that sort of thing. The picture on the right shows Cayman leather, and this is actually you. This it was actually sold in Bolivia. So we have a lot of native peoples using native animals to, to earn income and add value to our resources. Of course, this is an armadillo shell in in Bolivia, and the back of a, of an instrument in 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 Bolivia. I have done work with converting the tigu skin into leather which can be used to line tobacco boxes cigar boxes and that sort of thing now all of this comes down to wildlife farming and right now this particular activity is, is in the embryonic stages of development it's conducted on a subsistence level with very very little institutional support it is governed by very rigid laws and regulations we have very limited vertical integration in wildlife farming, despite a high hunting pressure and an increase in illegal importation. There is little or no byproduct utilization of neotropical animals. However, wildlife farming can lead to the conservation of genetic resources. Wildlife farming has the opportunity to contribute to eco ecological stability reduce hunting pressure and increase conservation, address incomes directly and both indirectly, provide a high quality animal protein that is well suited to our local taste and culture. It also has an impact on national feed and food security and highlights the role and the multifunctionality of agriculture, because when we speak of agriculture, very often we only refer to those domesticated species of sheep and goats and pigs and cows, all of which have been introduced to this part of the world and all of which have very high costs of production, whereas very little research has been directed on our native species. In concluding, I need us to revisit those quotes that I started off with. We need to use regional materials. We need to match those available animals with the available resources. And we need to ensure that more knowledge is generated on our imported species. More knowledge is generated on the animals in our backyards than on the imported species. I would like for us to focus research on developing production systems for key food species and review legislation on neotropical animal conservation production and utilization to confer value to our native species and adopt national strategies to focus on food sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh, for a, I'm sure would have been a very informative and um, interesting presentation regarding the neotropical wildlife species here in the Caribbean and the different ways in which we can utilize our um, wildlife as they form a critical part of our bioeconomy and how we can leverage this bioeconomy to also expand on the diversity 
of our economic options here in the Caribbean. Um, and as we just dive into the meat of the matter regarding um, wildlife and the different meat options, we now turn our attention to the issues relating to uh, wild meat and bushmeat consumption, and also the interesting cultural norms. Because within the Caribbean, we have a number of indigenous peoples which reside in the Caribbean region, from the guard fauna to um, the, the other um, indigenous persons around the Caribbean. And the issue of banning or you know, setting strict policy against these types of activities will be insensitive to the uh, cultural and social norms that have existed way before even Columbus settled here in the Caribbean. And to take a look at this, we will transition to Dr. Natalie Van Vliet, who is the wildlife and livelihoods expert at the Center for International Forestry Research, um, C4, which is based in Indiana, in, in Indonesia rather. Now, her research, Dr. Van Vliet's research at C4 has focused on the links between wildlife and livelihoods. She has worked for the last 15 years on wildlife management, hunting, and wild meat trade. Her focus is on the contribution of wild meat to food security and the local economies in Central Africa, the Amazon, and more recently in the Caribbean region, more particularly in Guyana. Working at local, and nation local national, and international levels, her research intends to provide more visibility to current wildlife use and provide objective data for innovative management practices that include ecological, cultural, and socioeconomic sustainability. And Dr. Van Vliet has also been a very critical ally as well with the Caribbean Wildlife Initiative here at CBS. And we are about to indeed launch into some pilot studies on well meat, uh, well meat use in Trinidad and Tobago and also in Guyana. So I introduce to you now Dr. Natalie Van Vliet. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thank you very much uh, to your team in general for inviting me in this very interesting uh, webinar. Uh, so I am, um, uh, if you would like to share the screen for me, Kurt. <laughs> So I was um, kindly asked to present about wild meat or bush meat perspectives uh, worldwide with examples from uh, the world, from particularly from Africa, the Amazon, and a little bit in the Caribbean where I am recently working. So um, uh, next slide, please. So there it is obtained through hunting, capture, trapping. Wild meat continues to contribute to the diets of human populations worldwide. So from the tropics to temperate areas to the most remote communities living near the poles, eating wild meat is still a reality. Several studies have now collected site level data for communities, particularly in Central Africa and the Amazon. Uh, to estimate re regional harvest rates. And those studies suggest that annual offtake rates for Central Africa alone would be to up to uh, 12 million tons per year. In the Brazilian Amazon, this is estimated to about 1.3 million tons of meat per year. Unfortunately, data for savanna areas, dry forests, tropical mountain areas and islands like those in the Caribbean remain very poorly documented. So most of the research has focused in the Congo basin, in the Amazon basin, but actually white meat consumption and trade within the Caribbean is largely understudied, at least uh, at, the, at the research level. Next slide, please. So eating terrestrial wild animals for food or medicinal purposes is often referred as bushmeat. But what is bushmeat? I, I tried to play a little bit and Googled the word bushmeat in Google. And these are the images that are, that are shown. So what do these images tell us? When I look at these images, what I see is first of all, that bushmeat seems to relate more to African context, as you can see from the species shown. 
chimpanzees, dikers, which are all African species. Secondly, the word bushmeat pictures dramatic connotations with bloody scenarios in which apes and monkeys are being cruelly sold. Uh, third, the meat seems unhealthy with flies all, all over the place and meat being sold in smoked and in very poor hygienic conditions. Fourth, most of the images show people selling meat. So I think the trade aspect seems to be highlighted in these images. Last, people selling bushmeat seem to come from poor backgrounds, portraying a link between poverty and a bushmeat trade. Next slide, please. In contrast, when you Google the word wild meat, this is what the search of images yields. In those images, wild meat is pictured as meat, mostly fresh meat, clean, ready to eat, with spices on top, nicely cut, gourmet-like, I would say, you almost want to eat it right away, and the negative connotation of criminality, unhealthy food, poverty, backward, um, backward um, traditions is absent. There is even one image of wild animals alive, perhaps suggesting to me that eating wild meat is not necessarily antagonist to conserving it too. So this is perhaps why most recently uh, it is the word wild meat, which is most often used in international arenas. The definition of wild meat as adopted by IUCN refers to terrestrial animal wildlife used for food in all parts of the world. Instead, uh, bushmeat, you know, if we refer to the Oxford English Dictionary only refers to meat from African wild animals used for food. And wild meat does not have the negative connotations that uh, perha perhaps bushmeat has. Next slide. So terrestrial wild animals harvested for food include a variety of, uh, of mammals, small to large, arboreal or terrestrial, diurnal or nocturnal, so a wide range of mammals. But it also includes birds. Next slide. Um, reptiles and amphibians, next slide. So this is a tortoise uh, being harvested by a kid in Guyana and also insects, but fish and other aquatic species are excluded from the definition of white meat. Next. So, um, yes. So wild meat plays a key a role uh, in local economies as shown in, in several publications. This recent publication from the Amazon region um, offers a recent economic valuation of the nutritional and monetary benefits of wild meat across Southwestern Amazonia using data from indigenous and non-indigenous communities from 30 sites. And the authors here confirm the following three states, statements. First, wild meat is essential for rural populations in southwestern Amazonia. Second, subsistence hunting is critical for food security for Amazonian people. Third, social economy of rural Amazonian populations depends on hunting practices. And those results are comparable to what has also been observed in many other parts of the world. Next slide. In a diet dominated by chicken, as Michelle showed, and in, in also industrial meats, wild meat, even if consumed on only on occasional basis, highly contributes to dietary diversity. So despite the low importance of bush meat or wild meat uh, in urban areas measured in terms of frequency of consumption, we show that these wild sources of animal food continue to play an important role in terms of dietary diversity. Next slide. Uh, can you play the video for me, please, Kurt? Is it working? I think you have to unmute your your microphone <laughs> to play it. Yeah. 
Hey, Kurt, you will have to share the computer audio when you hit share. Okay. I think uh, mine was probably me to start with that. I'll have to go back to the beginning. I get it something nice and spicy now. Yeah. Let me make a curry, man. Curry what? Chicken? Nah. Nah. I don't want cooking. <sighs> hey, Santana. Santana. Look at Wana. A what? A Wana boy. Curry, curry, curry. Ha ha. So this is just to introduce um, the the um, the the reasons why people eat wild meats. We can go to the next slide, please, Kurt. So uh, in some uh, in some occasions, uh, people eat it as a luxury pro product or as something in between. You know, it can be either a necessity or a luxury product or something in between something like a, an irreplaceable necessary luxury. So the situations vary across the globe. In many rural areas, wild meat is the only source of protein available daily. And as such, people have virtually no choice but to eat wild meat. Um, where other meat products exist, for example, in urban areas, the price of wild meat in comparison to uh, other sources of meat affects the choice. So where white meat is very expensive, consumers might prefer chicken or other alternatives. And white meat is rather consumed as a luxury product. The incentives for white meat consumption are complex and do not only depend on availability and prices. Familiarity, identity, and taste for white meat are among the values that our nervous systems shape by starving for the familiar flavors and aromas of white meat. So food preferences and habits are formed in large part through uh, childhood experiences and actually persist throughout the course of an individual's life, helping to maintain memories and strengthen connections with traditional origins and territory. The importance of hunting for cultural prestige is also a reality in, man, in many contemporary societies. Either through collective sharing or through reciprocity logic, wild meat sharing continues to contribute to str strengthen social bonds and reproduce cultural identity. This is something important to keep in mind. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, next slide, <laughs> what's that? Yes, next slide, please. Something wrong. Um, however, wild meat has raised a lot of concern worldwide because hunting constitutes the third most important threat to wildlife. Significant reductions in population of tropical mammals due to overhunting have been increasingly documented in Africa, Asia, and Latin America over the past 25 years. Uh, next slide. More recently, given the COVID context that Kirk introduced here, a lot of focus has been given to the health implications of eating wildlife. Many governments and NGOs have lobbied to stop any type of wildlife use. Next slide, please. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to caution about the risk to, uh, of oversimplifying the links between health and wildlife. Those linkages are very complex and are difficult to explain here in detail in a, in a 10 minute presentation, but they can be summarized in the three main points. First, white, white meat is essential for the health of people that eat it and depend on it because it's a vital source of nutrients as Michelle showed, but also because it contributes to the vitality of hunters and communities at large. Second, wildlife-based preparations constitute a plethora of medicinal solutions employed by numerous cultures since ancient times and are still being used in different parts of the world as primary or complementary treatments. So there's a clear link between wildlife and human health there too. And third, wildlife and humans may share similar pathogen pools. 
that can spill over from wildlife to humans or vice versa. So the close contact between wildlife and humans when hunting, butchering, and consuming constitute transmission pathways of zoonotic diseases between wildlife and animals. Next slide, please. I will stop this last presentation. Uh, in the next slide comes a short video where I would like to show local perceptions about wild meat and health, because those perceptions need to be considered in any strategy to change people's behaviors towards wild meat. The video is in Spanish, but with um, translation in English. Can go ahead. la mejor alimentación en cuanto a la carne la de, ¿no? porque por eso duraba tanto de primero la gente ayer enterramos una señora de 105 años porque ella no comió comida con tanto fin entonces pero no es igual que usted comerse una carne que es natural que usted comerse un pollo que viene de una de un galpón con unas un tratamiento de, 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 de drogas, de, bueno, de tantas eh, vitaminas y tantas inyecciones, no sé, no es algo, algo bueno, porque entonces ahí donde nosotros nos damos cuenta de que pues hoy nos resultan una cantidad de enfermedades dentro de las familias. Yo hice mi menú y lo pasé a la Universidad Nacional, entonces pues él me dijo, pues pase su menú, ¿Cómo usted va a ofrecer un plato a un alumno que pueda desarrollar bien la mente como más tranquilo? De la mía fue más, más como decir, sana, sin químicos. Que los, que los alumnos mismos decían, eso sí. Entonces yo salí aprobado pues, en eso por seis meses y le di todo el tiempo, le di carnita y mono. La seguridad alimentaria está en medio de todo el debate de qué es el bienestar, de qué es el desarrollo. Can de stop it here. De stop la diversidad. Yes. Uh -huh. yes, and we can go to the next slide, please. Yes, so um, I hope you understood. So the connection was not too good, but um, the main message of, of, of this video is that a lot of people perceive uh, very positive links between wild meat and health because as compared to um, uh, industrial production uh, systems, for, for example, chicken production, well, it is perceived as more natural without chemicals, etc. So. Um, while I strongly believe that more efforts need to be put in place in understanding the zoonotic diseases associated with wild meat consumption, a one health approach to the issue should, in my perception, include a human dimensions component. So I take this opportunity to highlight the incredible potential of human dimension sciences in behavior change initiatives, in this case, in relation to food safety. The study of wildlife value orientations allows to comprehend the complex values that shape the relationship between humans and wild meat for a better understanding of the cultural constructions that shape beliefs, attitudes, and behavior among the different beneficiaries of wildlife. This to me requires much more effort in the future and urgently given the context. Thank you very much, Kirk. You can, there is a last slide to thank you all. Thank you very much, Natalie, for a very thought provoking um, presentation. And as we saw that the highlights of the relationship between humans and wildlife we are a big part of the problem, but we are also, as Natalie is pointing out, a big part of the solution um, that we need to improve that relationship with our wildlife species here in the Caribbean. So I want to also take this opportunity now to transition to what particular diseases or challenges that we would have 
with wildlife hunting and the consumption of wild meat here in the Caribbean. And we turn to a regional specialist, Dr. Rod Supal, and he has a close affinity with a number of um, Caribbean hunters here in the Caribbean. So he has a unique perspective, not only as an academic, but also a practitioner. He is a veterinary pathologist um, at the UWI St. Augustine campus. Dr. Supal is a lecturer in veterinary pathology at UWI, the School of Veterinary Medicine. He also performs diagnostic duties with the SVM necroscopy and histopathology service. His current research focuses on wildlife health as well as infectious disease and neoplasia, especially as those relate to One Health. He has conducted some very intriguing research here in the Caribbean on wildlife species, including mongoose, songbirds, a variety of them, and also the um, agouti species as well. And I am looking forward to this particular presentation. And I turn over to you now, Dr. Supal. Hi, good afternoon, Kirk. Good day, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me to present today on behalf, especially on behalf of my institution, the School of Veterinary Medicine. So I'll start sharing my screen. Okay. So welcome once again to everyone. So I'm a veterinary pathologist. So people might want to know, well, why veterinary pathology and how does it relate to wildlife? Well, doing necropsy or postmortems on wild animals gives you a one of the closest interactions with wildlife that you have. You can um, detect diseases, you can detect, detect what they're feeding on and whatnot. So it's, it gives you the, probably one of the closest interaction with, with wildlife that um, most veterinarians will ever get. So what are some of the threats to wildlife? Uh, Cook probably outlined some of them earlier. Uh, most of them are as a result of human activity, over hunting, loss of habitat because of deforestation, squatting, agriculture, road development, pollution, climate change caused by humans and disease as well as introducing invasive species. So what are some of the disease risks? Well, all of, all of the major types of organisms, you have viruses as we see with our current coronavirus scenario, scenario uh, West Nile, avian influenza from wildfowl, right? Um, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, yellow fever, all of these. So I highlighted, highlighted the ones that are probably most um, pertinent to the Caribbean here. There are a lot more on, on, on this to, to add to this list. Bacteria have E. coli, Salmonella campylobacter, several types of mycobacteria causing TB, leprosy, as well as aquatic mycobacteria. Parasites, uh, one of the ones we're concentrating on now would be Trypanosoma cruzi, and there's also malaria. And of course, there yeah, are the unknown pathogens that could arise from wildlife. Having said this, most wildlife that would be harboring pathogens would be actually seem very healthy looking. When you look at them, there's not, they're not going to be having a, a runny nose or a diarrhea or whatnot. They'll be looking perfectly healthy, yet they may harbor uh, organisms, viruses especially, that could be transmitted to humans and could cause um, pandemics. So there is a zoonotic disease threat from consumption of wild, wild meat. Uh, so that it, it provides that closer interaction where um, preparing the carcass uh, as well as um, preparing the meat um, for consumption, right? So there's a need to determine what are the prevalent path pathogens harbored by wild animals uh, and uh, which may pose, um, pose a zoonotic threat. However, despite the growing genetic threat as, as evident by COVID, our understanding of the process of disease emergence remains uh, a little bit poor. Uh, we could do more, right? So uh, to examine and to fully examine this, 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 this zoonotic disease emergence, we need to have a multidisciplinary approach uh, to measure the biodiversity of microbes in wildlife. So the risk of emergence of zoonotic disease from wildlife depends on the diversity of my microbes in, in wild animals, the effects of environmental change on the prevalent pathogens in wild, wild populations, wild, wild animal populations, and the frequency of contact between humans, domestic animals, as well as wildlife reservoirs. So uh, we are gonna concentrate a little more on the hunting aspect of it. Uh, so wildlife management is um, conservation and 
is uh, part of the or well, use of wildlife. Sorry, it's is, is part of national and local economies. Um, hunting is is one that so, uh, generates income for for hunters in Trinidad. Uh, I don't know for other countries, but generally, definitely so in Trinidad. And so sustainable use of wildlife is supported by international conventions. And the value of hunting and wildlife can be direct or indirect. If you have meat, um, trophies, rural development, habitat, habitat conservation, aesthetics, uh, improving the quality of life for some hunters, tourism, as well as disease monitoring. So in our experience, in my own experience in collecting wildlife samples, hunters have played a very important part. Uh, without them, I probably wouldn't have collected like about three quarter of my samples. Right, and why did, why this isn't so? Because they spend a lot of time in, in the forest. They have time to observe wildlife um, in different seasons, and uh, con and they are many of them are concerned with the health of, of the wild animals because they need healthy animals to be able to consume, as well as to help keep to propagate their um, pastime. So some of the disease risks that may arise from wildlife. This again, this is more concentrated on um, on our situation. So it's, uh, there's the potential for acquiring leprosy from the armadillo footpad. Uh, right now we're doing a lot of work on Chagas disease, which is spread by triatamine bugs, as well as possibly through contaminated animal blood. There's always the presence of leptospirosis, especially when dealing with sylvatic rod rodents. There's tick-borne diseases. We do have um, evidence of Lyme disease in Trinidad. Other vector-borne diseases, you have leishmania, West, West Nile, yellow fever virus, malaria. From the gut content, you could get bacteria, bacteria such as Salmonella, E. coli, and Campylobacteria. Uh, there's, again, there's a COVID experience where an unknown respiratory virus may arise from wildlife. And of course, there's trauma and, 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 and snake bite, which um, could affect hunters. So what are some of the behaviors displayed that um, would evoke some of these risks? So basically by just entering the forest, you expose yourself to vector-borne diseases. So there's always going to be mosquitoes in these rainforests. There's contaminated water. So if your water runs out, you need to um, consume some from a little pond or a stream, you could pick up um, leptospirosis, bacteria, um, some protozoan, and as well as other par parasites. Hunters tend to spend a lot of time in, in camps where there may not be um, refrigeration facilities. So you have uh, potential for spoilage of your carcass, especially with armadillo and, and, and peccary um, carcasses. They, so they, and sometimes, so they use, a lot of them would use shotguns. So there's a potential for spilling intestinal contents which could contain bacteria and that could cont um, contaminate the, um, the rest of the meat. Apparently the, some hunters have conveyed the, um, Thing where the, the distance of the animal is shot may affect um, how fast the animal spoils as well. So, and then uh, when the, they catch the animal, it, they're going to um, interact with the fresh blood of the carcass. So, um, there's potential for um, spread of organisms from the carcass um, to them, especially if they have um, breaks in their skin. And of course, there's the illegal Im um, importation of wildlife for the pet trade as well as uh, meat. Which um, which is done in Trinidad. So having said this, now there's a need for a regional or a national um, wildlife disease, um, disease surveillance. So it, it, this will help us to manage and mitigate any zoonotic diseases that, that could arise from wildlife that will affect, or that could affect livestock and poultry as well. And this would involve lots of um, work from veterinarians. So and, and as you see, uh, because of the um, COVID experience, there's more efforts being invested worldwide in the surveillance of pathogens that could affect um, wild animals. And so first of firstly, you need to start collecting samples. And that is one of them, that is a, a very difficult proposition because a lot of hunters hunt on weekends. Um, it takes a lot of time to catch animals. Uh, sometimes you go out with them, there's, they, we don't catch anything at all. So, um, so what we do, we just basically sometimes rely on, give them the, the sampling materials, the, the, um, the bags and whatnot, and they would cut, um, put, it, put the gut content, the blood in, in tubes and um, send it to, and chill it and, and send it to us. So that's how we get samples. And this is because wildlife populations are usually remote, difficult to access. Um, the pathogens are not always um, similar to those of domestic species. 
So there, so we need to collab. So in order to collect samples, we need to collaborate with um, government organizations, hunters, and uh, even those who spend a lot of time, hikers, whatnot, in, in the wild, so that they would, so everybody would have a chance to collect, um, to help assist in collecting samples or knowing where 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 to to, to find um, samples. So why do we need to know what diseases are there in wildlife? Well, it will help us in improving the, the rate of our response to any potential disease outbreak that could arise from wildlife. And so it helps us in that uh, in investigating and diagnosing is a key to preventing future problems. So you need scientists with background in veterinary medicine, pathology, virology, bacteriology, biochemistry, parasitology, microbiology, as well as um, in wildlife ecology, because eco the wildlife ecology is going to impact on where the wildlife are, what, what they eat, what they, um, the environment, and all of these in terms of the One Health concept would affect the emergence of disease. And of course, laboratory facilities for testing is, is quite important as well as for storage as well, which is one of our major challenges at this point in time. So let's see what we've been seeing um, in our own experience. So we, in the last couple of years, we um, did a preliminary study into the um, Chagas disease in, in, um, in Trinidad. So we found um, that the bugs have been um, collecting, have been feeding on humans, wild animals, right? So there's that potential for this disease to spread. Uh, more extensive studies are, are, are being um, prepared as, at this point in time. Uh, so they've been fed feeding on the agouti, the uh, red howler. One of the other things that we're doing right now is um, basically trying to get some background data on the microflora and endopar on all parasites of our wildlife, especially the hunted ones. So to pick out if there are any um, potential for zoonotic disease spread, right? Uh, we haven't been able to do viruses as well because again, um, storage is, is an issue, but we have been, for, for hunted mammals, we've been looking at the um, microflora, nasal and, and gut, as well as the endoparasites and ectoparasites. Uh, so one of the potential um, problems of importing, illegally importing animals is we can illegally import disease, diseases as well. So we found that um, because the, um, the finch is a very popular bird in Trinidad, these finches, and when they, when they, they, they sold for lots of money, so they, there's a lot of illegal importation from the mainland in South America. And they brought across some pox viruses, which are not known to occur in our local species and which are um, the, the same species, but there are varieties in terms of the um, type of song and whatnot, as and some um, phylo, um, physical variety um, difference. So it could, and some of these birds are released into the wild. Uh, so there's a potential for introducing new viruses into our own birds. So ongoing pro ongoing projects would be the ones that are uh, already discussed. The just the um, determining determining the um, inf infectious organisms or the um, microflora and parasites of these um, animals. We're currently investigating diseases affecting hunting dogs as well as um, parasites and leprosy in um, armadillo, and just a general survey of our clinical cases of native wildlife to see what are the major diseases affecting them. So I thank you for that and turn you back over to good. Thank you very much, Rod, for a very intriguing um, presentation. And we know we will feel some questions in the question and answer section. And um, I do share your concerns regarding the acquisition of samples from um, wildlife species, and you have to definitely make that close collaboration with hunters, uh, as I had a similar experience during my research as well. Um, we now turn to Dr. Tarya Saronin. Um, she is from the University of Helsinki, and she's the Associate Professor of Emerging Infectious Diseases, and she will present on One Health forest habitats, wildlife, and infectious disease pathogens and outbreaks. Dr. Saronin is a researcher and a docent of virology at Medicam and at the Department of Veterinary Biosciences at the University of Helsinki in Finland. Her research focuses on the evolution and molecular epidemiology of zoonotic pathogens, and most recently on pathogen discovery. 
which research aims to understand factors that determine the dynamics and the emergence of zoonotic pathogens. Her research lies in the changing traits of microbes, and she aims to produce through her research knowledge to help prepare for various infectious threats in a changing environment. Her work examines those environmental factors that influence the emergence of infectious diseases. Her research group have, has, notably, um, has notable research achievements, including discovering Ebola virus, the Bombali strain from bats in Kenya, and also novel arena viruses from, of all animals, boa constrictors. And Dr. Saronin has authored and co-authored over 80 peer-reviewed scientific publications with over 1,200 citations. Dr. Saroni. Thank you, Kirk, and uh, thank you for inviting this talk. Um, uh, and I want to also begin by thanking the previous speakers. It's, it's been very fascinating and uh, we share many, many thoughts that so I will be repeating many of the uh, thoughts already discussed here. So uh, in, in this uh, short talk, I will uh, discuss of disease emergence from wildlife and, and factors driving this emergence. Um, I'm a biologist from the background and I have been studying uh, mainly rodent and bat-borne uh, viruses uh, throughout my research career. Um, uh, the last year, it's, it's all about COVID-19, of course, and I, I really look forward to getting back to other, other viruses as well, but looks like we still have to work quite a bit on, uh, on coronaviruses still. Uh, I'm representing uh, Helsinki One Health Network, of our University of Helsinki in Finland. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's a fairly new uh, network. Uh, and, and we try to uh, combine all the different research fields in the One Health uh, field, uh, including the social sciences, environmental sciences, uh, and, and animal and, and human health sciences. So, um, I'm a biologist, but uh, I, I'm also a virologist. So viruses are my my favorite pathogens. So I will be mostly talking about them and, and why. Uh, because most of the emerging infections are viruses. And, uh, and actually, nearly two thirds of human infectious diseases do arise from uh, wildlife originally uh, or domestic animals. And we need to know and understand more about uh, these zoonotic infections and why they, why they emerge so that we can uh, prevent uh, the next pandemic and, and not just pandemics, but local epidemics and, and infections. Um, so I think there needs to be a focus on early detection and rapid response, both of which have already, already been mentioned today as well. So wildlife is, is full of uh, microbes, whether it's viruses, bacteria, parasites. They've always been there. They will be there. We cannot uh, uh, eliminate these pathogens. Uh, but what is key is, is can we prevent spillover? And uh, something perhaps uh, that hasn't been so much discussed yet today is the spillover to domestic animals. So actually, if we think of, of pandemics or epidemics, uh, this is uh, one of the key steps. So there is an intermediate host. We have wildlife pathogens that come into contact with um, domestic animal or industrially produced animals. Uh, these are typically uh, in high density and the viruses start to spread, or the, or the microbes start to spread in these domestic animals and amplify uh, in these species. And from there, uh, they might then spill over uh, to people. And, and if they uh, are able to amplify in the human population and transmit human to human, uh, that's when we start to see uh, uh, major numbers of cases. 
So uh, quite rarely uh, the spillover is directly from the spill uh, from the wildlife to humans. So if we think of these major pandemics, there is quite often an intermediate host. Not always, but often. So in my opinion, the best way to control this is, is surveillance, early, de early detection, and perhaps even forecasting or predicting. Uh, I think at the moment we, we do admit that this uh, prediction or forecasting is uh, perhaps not reality. It's still a bit of science fiction, but maybe uh, in the years to come, we, we may even get there. Um, so the majority of emerging diseases are caused by viruses and particularly those that have an RNA genome. And, and here you have a map of uh, showing newly emerging, re-emerging diseases all over the world. And um, why RNA viruses? It's because they have uh, genetic instability, meaning that they evolve fast and, and fast evolution allows for quick adaptation. So, uh, in, in some ways, if we think of these major epidemics, we, we can focus a little bit on the viruses and it, on those that have an RNA genome. Uh, but wildlife is full of viruses. We have thousands or, or tens of thousands of viruses in there. And um, how to predict or know which ones might then spill over to other species and, and cause disease. That's something we don't know. It's, it's a very complicated uh, issue. So here we have um, factors related to the agent, uh, the virus, uh, which are the topic of, of my research. So we are trying to um, look into the viral genomes and how they evolve, and in particular, how they evolve when they jump from one species to another. Then we have the host, which might be the intermediate animal, or it might be us people. And there's a lot of factors, genetic background, uh, but there's also behavior, which has been mentioned here, and which is also very important. Um, uh, antibiotic resistance is also an emerging disease, and, and hence antibiotic misuse is, is uh, also important. But then we have also the environmental aspects, which are listed here. Uh, and, and really, uh, as already mentioned, there has to be a contact between uh, wildlife and people or wildlife and the domestic animals. So there has to be an exposure uh, before the viruses or pathogens can jump from one species to another. And then all the, all the factors affecting increasing uh, exposure to wildlife or increasing contact uh, will affect to the risk of, of uh, disease emergence. And these relate to um, land use changes, climate, weather, but also to, to uh, uh, things like poverty or natural disasters. Or uh, even on the list, you have lack of political will or lack of public health infrastructure. So this is really a huge uh, issue and, and many things uh, play into, into the uh, disease emergence. So um, what we do is, is we try to understand which of these drivers in the human animal environment ecosystem are important and which are the ones that we should focus on. Uh, we study in particular bats and rodents. These are species rich and, and they they're, so there's they are really the main source of, of uh, new diseases, in particular bats. Uh, I think we are coming back to the rodents uh, uh, as for example coronaviruses are more and more found in, in the rodents. Then we study spillover to, to livestock or domestic animals, whether it's in Finland, this is a uh, industrial farm in, in Finland, uh, or it's, it's uh, our work in, in Kenya. Uh, we sample the wildlife, the domestic animals and the people, and, and we do this uh, and we analyze the viruses in the lab and we try to look for pathogens found in all of these 
uh, wildlife, domestic animals and, and people. And, and this is uh, just an example of our study uh, already mentioned. So we, um, we found a new Ebola virus in Kenya. No Ebola viruses have been reported there before. And our approach was this, that we um, collected uh, samples of bats. All the species uh, initially, a few samples of each uh, species, and we screen them using a viral approach. So we screen them for all pathogens uh, at the same time using NGS approach. Um, here we started with a specific pan filovirus PCR that we had developed uh, that should detect all known and unknown uh, Ebola-like viruses. And we found one positive bat in the, in the uh, 2018 samples. And indeed, it turned out to be, by NGS sequencing, a full genome of a new uh, Ebola virus. And um, we have since gone back, and we have now four strains uh, of this virus on, on uh, different locations in Kenya. Uh, the same virus has been found in the PREDICT project, uh, also in Sierra Leone. And what we are now working on uh, is uh, trying to understand whether it's um, how common it is. Is it spilling over to, to other species? And, and so far, we haven't found any signs in, in humans in the area. But there is now a new report coming that actually in DRC, so in Congo, there is um, signs of uh, antibodies uh, against Bombali virus in, in people. So um, it might even be a human pathogen. And we have trained the personnel in, in Kenya to, to uh, detect this uh, virus as well. And we're trying to isolate the virus and, and grow, uh, grow it in cell culture models so we could work on it. But um, no one in the world has so far been able to uh, isolate Ebola virus from the bats. So we don't actually know if the bats are the host or not. Um, then moving on to coronaviruses. And, and if we're thinking of the early detection and, and in a way early warning. Um, coronaviruses are extremely common in bats. So wherever you study bats, you should find coronaviruses. And um, during this year of the pandemic, there's been a lot of discussion on what, what is the origin of, of SARS-CoV-2. And, and to me, at least, um, it is clear that it's, uh, it is from bats and it's been circulating. The virus has been for decades in bats before spilling over to people. So one could ask, could we have been able to predict that it's, uh, it will jump to people and cause disease? Well, we didn't, but uh, looking back at the data, maybe there were signs that we could have paid attention to. But how did it spill over from the bats to people? And was there an intermediate host? I don't think we know that yet. And it might very well be that we don't know. This virus is a champion. It can, it can infect people, but from people, it has jumped into multiple animal species. Um, I think the, the fur animals, minks and the raccoon dogs, uh, are very easily uh, infected and spreading the virus further on. And, and then it's, it's uh, cats and, and tigers. But then in also in, in laboratory models, you can, you can infect many, many species uh, with this virus. And this is very unique. And, and um, actually, uh, to me, uh, quite uh, scary as well, because this, we, we thought that species jumping is difficult for a virus. But uh, SARS-CoV-2 is unique uh, in its ability to infect multiple species. So coronaviruses are indeed common. This is from Finland, our country, our surveillance, where we found 13% of the bats positive. We even found, have one beta coronavirus um, somewhat related to MERS. Um, we don't think our, that our 
uh, coronavirus is a uh, human pathogen or potential human pathogen, but I think we also need to get back into this. Um, uh, but then uh, about the rodents, um, this is a study we did in, in uh, actually in Vietnam and uh, uh, coming now somewhat to, to the uh, wildlife meat. So in, he, in this study, we were studying um, rodent-borne diseases, rodent-borne viruses in Vietnam. And what we actually um, uh, did is, is uh, we bought rats from a, a wildlife market and, and we analyzed them for the presence of, of uh, some uh, rodent-borne pathogens. So uh, I also um, uh, been working with the ecologist for years and I it, it's very uh, tedious to to collect the samples and and it's it's very expensive and it's time consuming uh, so um, uh, those samples are precious but in this case it it was easy since we just bought 200 uh, uh, individuals and studied and uh, I want to point out here the hunter viruses uh, which are rodent-borne uh, viruses found all over the world. And uh, we found up to 50% uh, prevalence uh, in, in some of the species. And, and in overall, it was 7%, but it really depends on the rodent species. Uh, we were also sampling uh, people and looking at antibodies and looking at uh, exposure to the same pathogens. Uh, we found a about 4% uh, prevalence for hantavirus infections in the people. So uh, not that common that, that we, we were thinking, um, but still a significant uh, exposure. And, and these are the things uh, we th think should be done more, uh, looking at the surveillance and trying to understand the risk. Uh, so in the same place, looking at the wildlife, looking at the people. And, and for many viruses, then also the, the domestic animals. So um, going back to, to where I started, so indeed, uh, many of the human infectious diseases do arise from uh, wildlife, but really to, to understand the emergence and, and overall the persistence of these pathogens. Uh, we need a One Health approach, and, and I also have the list of different uh, fields of science that need to be included. Uh, maybe the disease ecologist was, was not mentioned uh, uh, yet, and uh, it is indeed uh, a very complicated uh, system, and, and to take all of this into account uh, needs a collaborative uh, effort. So this is my final slide. Can we prevent the next pandemic? I, I sure hope we can. And looking at the virology point of view, this is uh, in a way my to-do list. Um, I want to emphasize the surveillance. Uh, we can't really predict, but we can do surveillance. So uh, it is very, very important. And, and we need to understand which of the microbes can actually switch host and start to spread in, in human to human. Um, and we need to develop uh, conservation programs uh, mentioned already here. And, and we try to need to try to understand the, the, the pathogens uh, better. What makes some of the pathogens a higher risk than the others? And I turn it back to Kirk here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tarja, and um, I think it was a very interesting presentation. Um, and the One Health theme definitely runs through this particular series, and that lends to the multidisciplinary approach with which we need to examine our relationship with wildlife here in the Caribbean. And part of the Caribbean uh, Wildlife Initiative, we are endeavoring to also conduct some pilot studies in respect to the different pathogens that may be present primarily in species that are hunted um, throughout the Caribbean. So along with Natalie and Dr. Van Vliet from C4, we will be trying to develop 
some research studies in Guyana, in Trinidad and Tobago, and also Jamaica, where we'll be looking at different pathogens um, that might be present in these uh, wild species that are targeted for wild meat, because we need to definitely understand more where this, uh, where these pathogens lie, um, and we do understand it's going to be uh, pretty challenging because you you can have, for instance, a, an animal that may not be exposed or may be exposed at a particular time of the year. So you have time and space um, considerations that you have to take in, in, take um, on board where there is a wet season, there may be a dry season, and that may not always be um, you know, synchron synchronized throughout the Caribbean. And so we have to definitely look at those different nuances to be able to understand better the dynamics between um, the risk of infection and also spread. And so we are hoping to collaborate definitely with CarbVet. Those are a major partner that I um, didn't mention at the beginning. And also with the uh, OIE as well, um, which is a global organization that is responsible for animal health throughout the, um, throughout the world. And I do believe we have one or two persons from OIE present in the audience. And so I want to thank all of these speakers who just presented, and I hope that those presentations were very informative and uh, gives you some food for thought. And now we will turn to the question, uh, no, sorry, the panel discussion. So I just want to engage the panelists in uh, one or two questions uh, related to, to well, uh, meat consumption in the Caribbean. And the first question would be, what is or are the practical approach or approaches to mitigating against the risks associated with wildlife hunting and wild meat consumption in the Caribbean? And I will start with uh, you, Rod. Um, what what would you consider um, would be a practical approach or approaches to these risks? Hi, Kirk. Hold on. Eh? Right. So um, I think we need to find out exactly what is out there first before mm -hmm. we, we know how, what, what we're going to guard against. So uh, and that's what we've been trying to do to figure out what organisms are there, what viruses, what bacteria. So then, then it'll be better be able to guide people as to what, what um, preventative measures to take. So it's a long way to, to that still, but it, it needs to be done. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with you in, more. In, 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 in general, just re, um, regular um, sanitary measures, you know, um, if you have breaks in, if you're dealing with wild meat and you, you have breaks in your skin and your hand, you, you wash your hands properly or, or don't, or wear gloves, um, trying to get splashed with blood and, 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 and gut contents and whatnot. And proper cooking, for for the time being. <laughs> Correct. And I do believe does Trinidad and Tobago also have a guideline for for hunters at the moment in terms of you know these particular um, communication tools to to make them aware of, of of the right way to to go about um, hunting so that they can protect themselves or is this something that would need to be developed? I think it needs to be developed, but um, from my own experience, a lot of hunters would have a a fairly good idea. So, what are the um, safe, safe, safe things to do, and the sanitary things to do, and yeah, and a lot of people would practice the, the proper thing. Um, what I have been doing is when I have, whenever I go to the camps, I would collect a short video on on what they do in meat preparation. So, we're probably going to have a, a publication on that in in, in, in the near future. It's going to take a little while, but yeah. Well, that, that sounds promising. Thanks very much, Rod. How about you, um, uh, Dr. Singh? You want to weigh in here? Um, I would have to agree with Rod that some level of education is necessary. And uh, generally, hunters in Trinidad and Tobago are very much aware of the risks involved with the spread of zoonotic diseases. So sometimes even me, myself, I would go hunting and I would come back home with amblyomatics on my body. But because I'm aware of it, I, I, I try to educate as well. And I know Rod is doing a fantastic job with the, with the hunters in spreading the word on protecting themselves and being sensitized to the risks involved. 
Natalie, would you like to share some some comments on this as well? Um, just that I, I I I agree with uh, with Michelle and with Rod. Uh, I think uh, it is important to um, clearly explain the knowledge we have on zoonotic diseases, but also the knowledge gaps that we have at the moment, and particularly for species in the Caribbean and and uh, South America, we have a big gap of knowledge, and it's important to. Um, explain what we know and we and also what we don't know uh, because perhaps the risk is that people hear things about what's going on in Africa and may think that the same strategies have to be used in Latin America or the Caribbean without adapting it to uh, the local context and as I as Rod said without knowing if we're talking about the virus which is uh, most probably uh, transmitted through um, liquids or if it's transmitted what, what is the way of transmit if is it a virus is it a bacteria etc what is the transmission um step where does it occur at which step of the value chain is it the hunters uh who is at who is more at risk uh it's very difficult to actually develop um a strategy, an awareness raising strategy that uh, really fits the purpose. Um, this is why I think it's very important to continue and to strengthen research on pathogens in the Caribbean. Um, perhaps also to uh, position, um, let's say, produce a strategy that is specific to the Caribbean region. Um, and position this strategy in the world also as, as, as a strategy that may be a bit different from strategies used in Asia or uh, African contexts. One that is customized to our um, regional context. Thank you very much, Natalie. I, I think also to the risk not only um, extend into the transmission of pathogens, but also the biodiversity risk as well. Um, that may not necessarily be uh, pathogen based, but in terms of the actual ecosystem as well. So there, there is um, some level of research that we definitely need to, to engage in. And um, we definitely do want to work collaboratively with all the stakeholders across the Caribbean in this initiative so that we learn as we go. And as we go, we would then adapt our behaviors, adapt our approaches um, to fit the knowledge that we would have at the moment. And um, Tarja, I just wanted to get your input in terms of, because I know in, in Finland and in some of the Nordic countries, uh, hunting and also North America, right around the world, it is a, a pastime that people are actively engaged in. And I'm just wondering in terms of the experience within Finland, uh, what has been the, the approach there? Yeah, the, this is actually um, looking at the previous talk. So um, I think that uh, wildlife hunting, which uh, is is mostly reindeer, actually uh, in Finland, it's it's kind of um, uh, it's it's coming becoming very very popular at the moment because indeed, uh, like mentioned here, it is considered very healthy uh, meat and and also uh, sustainable meat because it's not industrially produced um, and and it is in a way considered very uh, clean food uh, here as well so um, of course uh, we there are issues but we are quite well aware of of the diseases and in, in particular the parasites here so um, actually the approach is very similar you, know, you have to just follow the basic hygiene and 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 cook your meat properly. Uh, so and, and you're fine. So that is actually something very translatable to to whatever region. Thank you very much for that. Um, we will now turn to the second question, and this question relates to what are the possible positive ways to leverage Caribbean wildlife as assets our regional economies and to support food security and food sovereignty. And I will start with Dr. Singh, Michelle, I will start with you with that question, if you don't mind. I was mind. just reaching to unmute my mic. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I know you are actively engaged already and ready to go. So take yes, the floor. Yes. Well, again, if we look at the CPU model, conservation, production, and utilization. Conservation in terms of preserving genetic resources and native fauna. And education in terms of research at different levels, primary, secondary, tertiary level institutions. Uh, recreation. Uh, we have the opportunity, the unique opportunity to do the eco-tourism resorts, as I had mentioned before. And that experiential tourism, I think, is going to add value to our native wildlife. We already have an appetite for wild meat. And very often we demonize the consumption of wild meat because we say it's um, causing um, decimate, decimating po natural populations and all of that. And I understand that. But at the same time, we have a right to food sovereignty, which simply means we have the right to eat or consume our native resources. And that is particularly important why I coined the term neotropical animal conservation. Because as was mentioned before, we need to develop strategies that are unique to the Caribbean with a Caribbean and a regional perspective, rather than adopt policies that have applied to the megafauna of the old world. All right. I, and we, we need to do, just do the research. We just need to focus, focus in on developing those production models for those animals that are the most consumed animals. And I can safely say for a guti, we are well on the way. For the lava and the lap, we are well on the way. Capybara, well on the way. But there is there are centuries worth of research on chickens and goats and sheep and pigs and cows with decades of work equivalent in non-domestic species from the neotropics. Would, would you say that that is the only could you speak to in terms of meat production or as a as a source of nutrition? Would would there be any other um, avenues to uh, leverage the economic value um, of neotropical species? I think in your talk you had mentioned about ecotourism, for example, and um, the possibilities, also uh, the production of uh, consumable goods, whether they be leather products or you know these and, other things. And and, and and let's not forget ethnomedicine. And as medicine as well, yes. All right. Again, because we have not really focused our attention on what we have in our own backyards, we can often run risk of losing it to other peoples. Indeed. You know, that, that biopiracy. So we have so much to leverage because we have one of the world's greatest biodiversity in our very own region. All right, and it's, 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 it's giving value to something that we take for granted. And that is what I think we need to do, whether it be for, through ecotourism to earn income or through wild meat consumption where we cook the food and add value to a particular commodity or through a value added product. As an animal scientist, it's very easy for us to translate all of the knowledge we know on animal production of domestic species into non-domestic species. You know, and on the on the um, on the topic of food safety, I know Nafli and I, I, we had worked on a particular guide on how to some some food safety guidelines for wild meat. You know, and that's something that was very very important because it's often cited as the biggest stumbling block in wild meat consumption because of the stigmas that are attached to it that have been translated from the megafauna and the bushmeat scenario that Natalie spoke of in the beginning. So I think we have a lot of opportunity to add value and build in monetary gain from our native resources. Yeah, and, and the reason why I think that is important, um, because Natalie, you had mentioned in terms of your presentation and I think some others as well, in terms of the perception, what was coming through was the perception of what wildlife means to us here in the Caribbean. And that's the central um, key to our relationship with wildlife, because if they are just something that is expendable and doesn't have high economic value or just value in particular, then we treat it with the, um, the uh, requisite respect. But if it is something that we truly value, we can see the intrinsic value in them, then we guard it more, we protect it more, 
and we wouldn't see the level of decline that we are currently see, seeing, like the, um, the, the report from WWF, which uh, states that in Caribbean and in Latin America, we have seen a 94% decline in the Caribbean. I mean, we are very blessed within the Caribbean. We have a number of endemic rare species within the region that are found no other way else in the world. And so we need to really treasure our um, fauna and our flora. And it is also intricately linked too to this whole climate change conversation as well. Because when we do not take care of our wildlife, our wildlife are um, key, key components of the ecosystem and provide a number of essential ecosystem services, whether they be seed dispersal, whether they be you know, within the, the food web, and, and just keep our um, ecosystems running and going. And so if we don't handle that, then the impacts of climate change will also be, um, will be integrated into this whole issue. So this is not on its own, only about wildlife. And this is about our relationship with um, animals and our relationship with nature. And that is the, to me, the key component that we need to get right. And at the crux of that, is really human behavioral change. So that's, and that's why I'm glad that you actually um, had that perspective also for our wildlife, because we need to also expand our view of it and um, then have that level of discussion in terms of how we go ahead and how we craft the requisite policies for, for the region as well. I don't know if, um, Rod, you want to jump in um, with this discussion in particular. Yeah, um, one of the things that, that um, wildlife farming could do is basically um, create employment for, for people in rural areas, especially those. Uh, and and it, it will also help by, by farming wildlife, we will reduce the, the burden on, on, on the wildlife population. So it allows them to, to, um, to increase the numbers. And, and those are two of the major things that we should look at. Um, and of course, ecotourism, we have all, all those, the variety of um, flora and fauna that we have, well, fauna in this case, um, will, will kind of improve tourism, which is one of our major products in the Caribbean. Yeah, so more, more than just sea and sand, but you know, we have sights and, and songs as well from, from nature. I think that's quite, quite important. Um, Natalie, I know that you also have some, some interesting views in this regard as well. Do you want to share? Kirka, are you referring to the values that we could, um, you know, the, we could uh, have for wildlife to increase the value of wildlife? Um, yes, oh, I, I mean, in that respect, I think, um, uh, well, at least in the Rupununi, where we are working now in the southern, southern part of Guyana, tour, tourism is uh, for us seen as an opportunity uh, to value, add value to wildlife uh, from a non-consumptive perspective, right? Because you have non-consumptive views and you have consumptive uses of wildlife. Um, we think in the Rupununi, we have an opportunity to raise the value of wildlife through uh, non-consumptive uses uh, because it's an area that attracts uh, bird watchers and people really looking forward to see specific wildlife. Um, it's important to raise the, wide, the value of wildlife and of wildlife friendly habitats. In the Rupununi, for example, if, if we do not add value to these wildlife friendly habitats, I'm, I mean economic value, then other land use types may be more interesting, economically speaking. For example, you may see that people will choose to transform these wild, savannas into agro um, industries for soya production or maize production as it is seen already in parts of Brazil where savannas are converted into these very intensive land use types. So our challenge, at least in the, in the, the project uh, in which I work now, which is called the Sustainable Wildlife Management Project in Guyana, is also to ensure that these wildlife friendly habitats um, have more economic value as compared to other alternative scenarios, which would be dramatic for wildlife and also for the livelihoods of people that depend on wildlife. So uh, our strategy is to work on tourism, but also to um, increase 
the, the, the cultural value, there is already a cultural value attached to wildlife that uh, we try to promote through uh, the, lead, the local leaders. To, so we try to help local leaders to add value, this cultural value to, to wildlife, which is important in terms of proud, being proud about your culture and the culture is linked to what you eat. So it's linked to wild meat and fish in our region. Um, I mean, we, 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 in, um, and, and there are very many other opportunities, like, uh, as Michel mentioned, uh, the opportunity to add value to sub products of wild meat. Uh, when people eat wild meat, they often throw away uh, a lot of the, the other parts of the animal that are not consumed, for example, the skin or the horns, uh, things like that, uh, the skin, peccary skin has a high, high value, which is not enough um, exploited yet. Um, in, and this is true for, for African context as well. Yes, and I'm glad you, you definitely made that point because we, we definitely have to, to raise the level of awareness where the economic value, and the intrinsic value within wildlife um, for the Caribbean. And so that the, as you also mentioned, the habitats as well because we have a lot of habitats that we just view it as bush and then when put against the proposed projects and we will be actually examining this in particular at the next, um, the next panel discussion where we look at uh, human activities and the impact um, on, on Caribbean wildlife. You, you, you would understand that developers will have their own take on it, but if you have definitive evidence in terms of the intrinsic economic value of let's say a wetland, a mangrove um, environment and the, the ecosystem services that that particular mangrove area plays in terms of carbon sequestration and the, the, the impact that has in your local uh, climatic conditions and as your output for, for CO2 from your country and how that mitigates against it, then I think that will become much more important in the very near future. And I think that we need to also, with the multidisciplinary approach, make the connections with what we are examining, what we're looking at, and also the bigger picture that is going on because the Caribbean is a very vulnerable um, region and climate change is one major, major, major problem there. And that is something that we are acutely aware of and I, I definitely want to uh, raise that level of awareness. Us at the Center of uh, Center for Biosecurity Studies, we are definitely aware of that as well. So I want to to just highlight that particular connection there. And um, Tario, do you want to to also add to this or? Um... Well, maybe just a quick comment. Um... Uh, something uh, which hasn't been mentioned is, is dilution effect, uh, which has to do with uh, with the biodiversity loss and and um, uh, which which really uh, tells tells that uh, with uh, decreasing biodiversity uh, uh, we start to have pathogens spreading faster and faster and. Uh, uh, maintaining biodiversity uh, is actually a key to, to control the pathogens in, in the wildlife. So this is yet another reason to try to work um, in, in maintaining the biodiversity. This is a huge challenge, not of course in the Caribbean only, but everywhere else in the world at the moment. And, um, and I was also uh, just agree with the land use uh, changes and, and planning the land use and, and taking into account the wildlife is is very important uh, aspect as well. Thank you very much. And so that will conclude our panel discussion period. We will then now look for the questions that have been posed. And um, I do see one question from Khadija Hassan. And she says, good afternoon colleagues, great presentations and thought provoking topics and projects occurring in the region. We are now starting to refine our animal control, import and export protocols, along with the early warning system and surveillance protocols. 
Do you have any recommendations on how to approach these or recommendations on diagnostic laboratories within the region that could assist with these programs? And I would direct this to perhaps Rod. Do you, would you be able to give um, Dr. Hassan some, some advice yeah. on this? Kadi Joe is my uh, one of my mentees. <laughs> <If it's cool. laughs> All right, so um, yeah, Kadija. Um, well, firstly, you need to um, know what 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 framework you want to set up, set it up in, and what what are your um, risks, what are your threats, and of course, there there are the typical OIE um, list A diseases and list B diseases that you need to to to, um, to take into consideration. And you need to, you probably need to look at some of your um, neighboring countries, what, what, they, what they have in place. Instead of having to go and reinvent the wheel, you could just ask around. Um, there's a meeting of Caribbean CVOs where you all could probably um, get, get some um, information or the, or the CVVMA. And um, then you just, you just adjust that according to what are, what are your needs after, after that. Uh, in terms of wildlife, there's a lot to be done in terms of figuring, figuring out what, what we need to guard against before we start guarding against. So, so yeah, that's as much as I could say though. Very much, Rod and Khadija. That would be through CARVET because I believe that they are the regional animal surveillance uh, network within the region, and they have done a they have a very good track record uh, within the region um, where that is concerned. So perhaps you can reach out to Dr. Eric Etter um, over at the CARVET, and he would be able to guide you. I could also uh, put you in contact with him uh, with respect to that. And we have another question, and this is from Dr. Irene Cruz. Cruz. Good afternoon, colleagues. Great presentations and definitely thought provoking topics and projects, like Dr. Khadija Hassan stated. In Aruba, iguanas are hunted illegally because the species is protected by the CITES Treaty. A request was received for an iguana farm where, a, where cuisine would be incorporated. Any recommendations on regulation, zoonosis, and public health issues? And we can perhaps take this in our own Robin. And I'll start with perhaps you, Dr. Singh. Uh, right, yeah. Well, first of all, I think that uh, that is an, um, I love that request. And it means people are thinking in the right direction. What we did when we started doing agouti farming in Trinidad, and that was part of my PhD um, thesis, we identified if there were any um, species types. So we were able to identify six different colors of agouti, one of which was never even heard of, which is the white agouti. All right. So when, you, when you're planning to do these types of operations, make sure you cater or you identify the biodiversity that already exists in your country. And then you wanna select animals from that biodiversity that gives a representation because you don't wanna focus only on the green iguana and neglect maybe the savanna iguana, which is a light green iguana. And then you have problems, the consumer may not want that or it, it may not be easy to um, rear in captivity, animal behavior and all of those things have to be considered. Um, iguana farming has had some success but because it's a reptile and sex is determined by uh, hatching temperature, some people have not gotten that right as yet. So all of those little things you would have to consider as well and work with the people, work with them every single day to work through the kinks in the system. The legislation must of course allow it because in Trinidad, we have a hunting season from, Feb to, from October to Feb, five months. And after, at the end of March, you're not allowed to have any part of a, any animal, live or dead, which means that wildlife farming actually becomes illegal during the close hunting season. But we've had some very positive discussions to allow people to keep animals during the close season. So I don't know what the policy is for Aruba, but there are basically five things you need to consider when you're doing any animal production. So genetics and breeding, housing, how do you keep the animal, what type of housing is best, um, feeding and nutrition, what are you going to feed, what are the physiological states, and then the socioeconomic factors, how much money is available to the farmer, how is he going to, which will dictate, of course, what type of system he implements. 
Thanks very much, Michelle. Uh, Rod, do you want to then weigh in also? Because I think the question um, spoke to zoonosis as well. And, yeah, well, uh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, just, um, just you can do like a quick um, microbiological and um, survey of the um, stool intestinal contents. Just to figure out what types of bacteria might be. I think bacteria might be one of your main things. Um, not to show how many viruses they would carry. So um, you could do a quick survey of the wild ones. And all oh, right. So at some point in time, you're going to have to capture some wild ones and put them into um, into your program. All right. Well, firstly, you need to figure out if your if your laws will allow capture and how many you, you can safely capture without affecting the wild population. And then and then you um, while they're in captivity, while they're in that um, quarantine period, you can test them and see what bacteria they carry. And then of course you have to be aware of your feeding and types of met metabolic diseases that um, iguana could carry and tailor your feeding program and breeding program to, to counteract that. So, and that's about it for now until you get probably into more details. And um, Natalie, do you want to offer any advice in this? It's hard to give an advice on on uh, on a species that is protected, right, by law. So as long as um, the species is protected, there is no way uh, sustainable use initiatives could be uh, promoted. And uh, as Michelle mentioned, in many countries, um, the legislation for uh, wildlife farming is um, either absent, totally absent, or very. Um, prescriptive, so it doesn't really allow uh, the system to work uh, um, um, in a way that it could contribute to reduce, um, to reduce unsustainable hunting or harvest from the wild. So um, yes, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, I, I, think, I think one of the things, perhaps one of the uh, recommendations here is, is that there is um, an enormous need to work together on the legislations regarding wildlife use in the Caribbean in general. Uh, in Guyana, uh, we are uh, making this effort to analyze the regulations at the moment and to see where there are opportunities and whether there is a need perhaps to further, um, further regulate the trade or um, uh, you know, through licensing, so through quotas, hunting seasons, et cetera. Um, but uh, a lot of the sustainable use initiatives in the world, not just the Caribbean, are, I mean, the legal framework is really a barrier for sustainable use initiatives to, to take place. And uh, sometimes uh, because um, uh, we lack, <laughs> um, uh, uh, lawyers in our teams, sometimes um, we we are more like from 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 multi multidisciplinary teams, but not always including lawyers who would have this view uh, in terms of um, recommending uh, what type of opportunities there are in terms of improving uh, the legal frameworks and. Um, I hope this is this could be a, a topic for discussion within our Caribbean network to see whether there are you know opportunities to collaborate and share experiences between the countries and discuss uh, those frameworks. And um, on that note, in terms of the legal framework, we're currently working with CITES, which would be the um, global entity that's responsible for the legislation aspect of it and also UNODC and we're currently reviewing um, Caribbean wildlife legislation and so uh, we haven't looked at Aruba uh, mainly because there are um, uh, entity of the um, the kingdom of the Netherlands right, more so than um, the Caribbean but if you would also like us to take a look at that particular legislation, we can we can also look. Natalie, I see your hand is up. Do you do you want to join in, or is that? Yeah, I just want to add perhaps that uh, it's um, it's very interesting to look at the at the legislation in neighboring countries or countries that are within the same region because the the differences in legislation might explain 
illegal trafficking going on from one country to the other. So for example, I think it's fairly known that during the close season in Trinidad, you have illegal exportation of white meat from Guyana, Suriname to Trinidad, these type of things. In Guyana, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, um, iguana is not a protected species. So perhaps th this would allow for places that allow hunting to then, you know, illegally uh, sell uh, these, those species in neighboring countries. So this is where it becomes very interesting to, um, I don't think uniformize regulations across the region, but at least have uh, share experiences and see whether uh, there is a need uh, for some, um, you know, some, some more rationale between uh, the legislations in the different countries as a way to limit illegal wildlife trade. And also um, to answer the question as well, I'll point you to, we were appointed rather to the Bohemian uh, wildlife legislation as a best practice type of legislation for the Caribbean. And that was um, offered by, Ms. Sophie Flensburg, who is the legal advisor um, at CITES, and she works very um, intricately within the Caribbean as well. So you can also reach out to her and she can also provide some guidance where that is concerned. Um, because I think Bahamas, if I'm not mistaken, um, has a similar problem with the illegal exportation of iguana species from, from within those islands as well. So um, it would be perhaps of interest to take a look at that. And I also wanted Tari to just jump in very briefly to also give her um, opinion on iguana because I know that she may not, may or may not be familiar with it, but I know it's a reptile. And I know you've done uh, virological studies in reptiles. So maybe you want to, to give, to weigh in here and give some, some advice as well. Uh, yeah, just, just maybe a comment that uh, I think for years and years we didn't consider reptiles as, as a source of uh, zoonotic infections. Um, we do find a lot of viruses that are related to zoonotic viruses in reptiles as well. So we have been studying arena viruses um, and, and they, are, they are found a lot. And there's actually coronaviruses are something to consider. So, uh, I was just thinking the researcher in me that it, I would like to study the virome or the microbiome of the iguana. Uh, I, I don't think we know too much of, of the diseases in them. Testing of those species from um, the forum um, through to the University of Helsinki. Well, I want to thank everyone who's contributed so far to this particular um, panel discussion. I saw your hand, Natalie, go up briefly and come back down. Do you want to say something very briefly? Very right in. Actually, sorry, Kurt, you were about to conclude. I, I, it made me think um, that um, it's uh, to complement a zoonotic study on iguanas um, and on other species. I think it would be very interesting also to look at taboos and uh, on uh, white meat in our region, because I think a lot of the taboos are linked or have an explanation with are connected to health. Uh, so there's a lot of, um, interestingly from the taboos uh, I have uh, studied in the Amazon region, uh, reptiles are and amphibians are, are mentioned a lot like uh, tortoise and um, uh, a particular tortoise, but also armadillo. So some, somehow we, we may find, uh, you know, uh, areas for cross-cutting between an ethno-zoological uh, approach and a more uh, lab-oriented approach. And I think the One Health approach allows for these multidisciplinary uh, studies. Well, definitely, because I definitely want to have that multidisciplinary approach because in order to craft more comprehensive solutions, I think that's the definitely the way forward. So thank you very much for that, Natalie. And uh, perhaps we can work on a uh, project uh, with respect to that going forward.
And um, as I said, I just really want to thank all of you for your very valuable contributions. Um, I think it was very informative. I found it very intriguing. And I hope those in the audience also found it very intriguing. Um, and we will now look forward to the upcoming uh, panel discussion, the final one for this month. And we will be examining human activities, um, whether it be urban development, land use changes, of course, um, because as we develop our populations, our societies here in the Caribbean, we also have to, uh, as population size increases, obviously there are there is demand rather for more space um, for different uses, and whether it be recreational, whether it be residential, or even commercial, and this utilizes our already restrictive um, land space that we have, and this has consequences, this displaces wildlife, and therefore our relationship with wildlife changes, our interaction, our contact, and the frequency and the length of that contact also increases, and therefore it puts us at different uh, types of risk. And so we will be examining that next week, Thursday, so I hope that you could all rejoin us at 1 p.m. And that is um, the 25th of February, um, 2021. And uh, we will definitely be looking forward to that. We have a number of pre presenters. We have Professor Julia Horrocks, and she is um, a professor of conservative ecology. And she actually was my professor in, in, in my undergraduate uh, studies here at the KFO campus, and I remember her fondly. She was a very, very amicable person. And you could ask her anything very approachable. And she has definitely lent to my understanding of eco ecology and ecological issues. And she's also been a very strong proponent um, here in Barbados and across the Caribbean, having pioneered and led a lot of the um, studies in the marine sea turtle project. Um, I remember she has done a tremendous work here in the Caribbean and also especially in Barbados. So she will lead that off and we also have some other presenters on there. We have uh, Professor Chris Ura from um, the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. And he's a One Health specialist there. And he also has a unique perspective and he will also share that. Then we also have two practitioners from um, Guyana, I'm sorry, Jamaica rather. Um, this would be the National Environmental Protection Agency in Jamaica, Mr. Ricardo, um, Mr. Ricardo Miller, and also Ms. Frances Blair. And she is also involved in the uh, planning, uh, spatial planning within Jamaica. So I want, if you can, and it's possible to tune in as we delve into um, the nuts and bolts regarding um, wildlife, regarding um, zoonoses, regarding also environmental conservation and also uh, development within the Caribbean. So I want to thank you all. And I will now turn it back over to Christiane, if you're there. Thank you, Director. Uh, before we wrap up, perhaps you might like to address the, um, the polls that have been popping up during the course of the afternoon. Sure. Um, would you, so did, I, I'm hoping that you guys did manage to actually take the final poll, um, which should be available. Do you guys see it? If you can, I'll just send a message in the chat and let us know. And if you could take that poll, we would appreciate it very much. This is very pertinent information that we need as we develop our program here at the Center for Biosecurity Studies. Thank you. And while that runs, we'll just uh, give a brief vote of thanks before we adjourn. So I take this opportunity to, of course, express thanks to Mr. Samuel Eugene and Mr. Jamal Innes of the Campus ID Services Department and our very own Mr. Wesley Moore, clerical officer with the Center for Biosecurity Studies, who together ensure that as far as possible, all technical considerations are taken care of when we're doing these broadcasts. 
So thanks also go out to the Office of Marketing and Communications of the UE Cave Hill campus for supporting our efforts to get the word out about this series. And finally, to stay connected with us, please send us an email to biosecurity at cavehill.uwi.edu. That's biosecurity, one word, at cavehill.uwi.edu with any questions or comments that you may have. Or we invite you to visit us at www.cavehill.uwi.edu forward slash biosecurity, where, as I mentioned earlier, you can find the recordings of these weekly discussions. Additionally, we're always interested in growing our web content. So if you have articles or research opportunities that you might like us to highlight, we're more than willing to explore those. Uh, we also welcome editorial contributions to our newsletter the next of which will carry further content on the Caribbean Wildlife Initiative, course offerings that are in development that you heard about and other related matters. So be sure to get your content to us as soon as possible if you'd like to make a submission to our next publication. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the team here at the Center for Biosecurity Studies, we look forward to seeing you next Thursday at 1 p.m. for the final installment of this series, Living a Wildlife, Catch Me If You Can, where, as you heard, we will look at One Health, Land Use Management, and Caribbean Wildlife. That's all for now, and we wish you a good afternoon. This session is now adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, see you.